Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to begin in just a moment here. I am Dan Esty, professor at Yale University, teaching in both the law school and the environment school, also in the management school at Yale. And we've got a wonderful panel for you today. And I'm just going to allow a little bit of time to pass so that people can join the conversation uh, out of the waiting room. So we're going to pause just uh, for a few seconds here and, uh, and then jump right into what I promise you is going to be a very lively and interesting conversation. So again, I'm Dan Esty, professor at Yale, uh, author, uh, editor of a recent book on uh, a topic quite related to our subject today. Uh, my recent book with my uh, co-editor from Yale, Todd Court, uh, is called Values at Work, Sustainable Investing and ESG Reporting. And both sustainable investing and ESG reporting will be part of the discussion here today. But our real focus is on climate finance. And that, of course, is an enormously important topic uh, at COP26, the conversation in Glasgow uh, that we're all hoping to help contribute to, uh, has made clear that the world is ready for a shift to a clean energy future for deep decarbonization. But it's also clear that we are going to need a lot of capital to flow to make the investments that are required to deliver on the promise of that shift to a clean energy future and a serious response to climate change. So we are going to dig in today to the issue of climate finance, a subcategory of sustainable finance, but an important, indeed a critical one. And I think our subtitle of making good on the rhetoric is really right at the center of the conversation in Glasgow. It's clear that there are a lot of parties ready to move, but it's also clear, particularly in the developing world, that the need for capital to make it possible is of some concern. And frankly, there is, uh, as we know, a commitment that was made some years ago from the developed world to mobilize $100 billion per year the assessment that's coming in is that we have fallen short, not terribly far short, but about $80 billion will be mobilized this year to support those investments uh, in clean energy and frankly, a broader set of supporting and enabling technologies and elements like uh, a, a smart grid and uh, all of the elements needed to make sure that a clean energy future can be actually functional and possible. So with that, I'm going to turn to our, our four fabulous panelists. I'm going to give each of them a, a five, six, maybe at the most seven minutes uh, opening comment to help share their perspective on these critical issues of what's required to make us really able to deliver on the promise of sustainable finance in support of real action on climate change and deep decarbonization. So first up today is Pankaj Bhatia. He's the deputy director of the World Resources Climate Project. And uh, the climate program there, of course, oh. is one of the most important ones at WRI. He's also director of the global uh, of the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Protocol, which again, a lot of you will know is one of the most important ways that we track whether we are moving towards uh, a clean energy future. And a lot of interest in that that I hope Pankaj will get into. Uh, if he doesn't in his opening comment, I'll push him on things like the uh, importance of, of how that protocol is guiding companies and finance institutions as they think about where they're putting their money. But particularly, uh, the issue of scope three emissions has really emerged in a very big way. But with that, let me turn things over to Pankaj to open our discussion. <clears throat> Thank, thank you very much, Dan, and uh, very glad to be here at this forum. Uh, I think we have five to seven minutes uh, to make our opening remarks, so I would just jump into some of the key points that I would like to make. Uh, if my slides could be, yes, thank you very much. Now, I think we will have time to cover a lot of details, but initially I would like to just make sure that we understand why we are worried about this uh, issue here, uh, setting robust corporate GHG targets. I think there are very important three objectives. One, how do we ensure that companies are ambitious? And that comes to the targets in terms of the value chain. 
you know, if suppose oil and gas sector industry um, is not setting targets for scope three, or as Dan said, financial sector company is not setting targets for scope three, uh, then clearly there is a problem in terms of ambition. I think second major problem is uh, double counting. How do you address the issue of double counting, particularly when you are purchasing credits? And how do you ensure that uh, it is a unique ownership to those claims? And I think the third question is, how do you address the issue of leakage? Uh, leakage that not only within the value chain, but also uh, beyond the value chain. And so with these three objectives, uh, we, we are now in the greenhouse gas protocol work, we are completing a new standard focus on removals, accounting of removals. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm just going to cover some highlight, highlights. I won't go through all the details and I may come back to some of the relevant points uh, during our uh, discussion session. So this is going to be a new greenhouse gas protocol global standard on land sector and removals. And removals. Uh, this will cover uh, guidance on land use and land use change impacts, CO2 removals and st storage, uh, biogenic products across the value chain. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, this is going to be a very comprehensive standard. As you can see, uh, it's going to have almost 21 chapters um, and also two annexes. It's, it's a, going to be a huge standard. And I think there are uh, reasons, very important reasons why we have to cover a lot of these details. Uh, it is currently going through an internal review process and we will be releasing a pilot testing version uh, in the first quarter of 2022. Uh, already a review draft has been completed and it is going through the technical working group reviews and the advisory committee review. I won't go through this, all the steps, but it is important to know that there are four steps on the accounting side, and then there are some additional steps on the calculation side, all uh, focus on removals. Next slide, please. So those who are familiar with the greenhouse gas protocol family of standards for business, uh, there is an original corporate standard that was released in 2004, and that is the foundation for most of the inventory work and, and, and programs all over the world. Then scope three standard was released in, in I think 2007 or 2011. Um, so it's almost 10 years, more than 10 years. And now we are going to release land sector and removals guidance in uh, 20, early 2023. And uh, once it is released, then the requirements will change. Uh, requirements with respect to reporting of scope three emissions are expected to change. There will be some new requirements also to report around system impacts that are beyond the value chain. And the focus there is to cover uh, leakage issues. And there will be also an additional uh, reporting category on removals, uh, which will be optional, uh, but it will have an important purpose, I think, for companies setting GSG targets. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> criteria for reporting removals. Uh, this is very important for us to <clears throat> understand that removals in a way is, is an asset. And one has to be very careful that when you take claims over asset that you actually meet some of these uh, important requirements, that there is an ongoing storage monitoring, uh, there is a full traceability, there is a primary data to support that removal claim. And, and there is also uh, um, steps in place to address uncertainty uh, with respect to that removals. Next slide, please. I mentioned that we are introducing a new category. Uh, people are familiar with scope one, scope two, and scope three, the value chain. We will be introducing in the context of the land sector, a new land tracking category, which will account for uh, systemic impacts, impacts outside the value chain. So companies perhaps uh, are already aware that and you could make uh, very useful, helpful climate actions interventions within your value chain. But we also want to be mindful that how they might impact um, the climate uh, emissions or removals outside the value chain or indirect land use change impacts in this particular case. Uh, and we will be introducing this category. This will be a required category and we will expect that uh, companies are also uh, tracking uh, progress with respect to this category. Next slide, please. So how do you identify and evaluate system impact of actions? Uh, as uh, we have seen in our previous guidance, 
uh, we provide an, uh, what is called consequential accounting approach, which is different from inventory accounting approach, uh, which is uh, used for understanding the system impact of actions, particularly with respect to what would have happened otherwise if you had not pursued that action. So there will be a, a detailed guidance on how to undertake this exercise along with the exercise uh, inventory exercise. Next slide, please. Uh, target setting, uh, <clears throat> we, we will provide guidance on setting separate targets for emissions and also targets that are uh, separately for removals. Uh, for targets that are focused on removals, there should be also accounting for reversals. So uh, if you recall in a previous slide, I said there's multiple criteria for to prove that you continue to maintain ownership of that removal, that removal continues to persist. But in case you're not able to meet those criteria, uh, the guidance will ask that you report uh, you report for reversals. So you report emissions, reversal emissions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Pankaj, I'm yep. afraid we've got to bring you to a, whatever your last slide is, because we've got uh, three beautiful speakers right behind you. We got to of make course. it for everyone. Yes, so I won't get into a lot more details. I, I think this slide can be my last slide and I will come back to other points. It is important that I mentioned about credit, so there will be guidance on how to avoid double counting and what kind of criteria to follow when companies would like to uh, bring in credits. But as we know that GSG protocol is the foundation for science-based target setting initiative. So there will be some additional rules that uh, target setting initiatives like SPTI would overlay on the accounting foundation that is provided by GSG protocol. Uh, I will stop here, thank you. Pankaj, thank you very much. You've given us a lot to work with that we'll come back to in our, in our back and forth. And I think you've really set the tone for our discussion. And I think it matches uh, the broader conversation that's going on here in Glasgow. And that is a focus on implementation of real action. And I think that is why I'm optimistic that COP26 will be seen as a watershed moment where we shift from rhetoric to action and we really dig into what's required for this deep decarbonization uh, and the implementation uh, includes, of course, a major focus on finance. With that, I'd like to introduce Nicole Pinko. Uh, Nicole is a senior analyst at the Climate Policy Initiative in Washington, D.C., and she has been working on a number of elements related to finance, including the Framework for Sustainable Finance Initiative. And so with that, Nicole, I hand you the virtual microphone. Thank you so much. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So as economies move to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, extensive evidence suggests that meeting the sustainable development goals and Paris Agreement objectives could bring widespread economic health and employment benefits. It can also improve the economic and financial stability and reduce inequality post-COVID. The IMF recently estimated the multiplier effect for green spending, including clean energy and biodiversity conservation, to be two to seven times greater than non-green spending. Next slide, please. Thanks. Last week, CPI released the final version of the Framework for Sustainable Finance Integrity. We usually just call it the framework. It's a bit of a long name. So the report is built off the feedback we received on our consultation draft of the framework, which was released last May. This is the first guide to define necessary action across the public and private financial sectors and provides a universal set of sustainability guardrails across the financial system. The overarching goal of the framework is to encourage ambition to deliver meaningful sustainability and net zero results by contributing to a clear pathway for more coordinated action and reinforcing the multiplier effect these actions will have on the real economy. It aims to ensure the integrity and accountability of pledges and initiatives, as well as cross-sector coherence and impact on net zero and sustainability. Next slide, please. In undertaking this work, we were guided by our advisory council of leading personnel and organizations from each segment of the financial ecosystem. This includes insurers, commercial banks, development banks, asset managers, civil society, and government representatives from across Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. As the framework is intended to facilitate coordination across public and private financial institutions, developed and developing economies, it was important to have representation from a broad variety of sectors and geographies. Next slide, please. Thanks. In creating the framework, we set out to answer three main questions. One, how do we assess the integrity of commitments and track progress towards meeting them? Two, 
how to coordinate across public and private financial actors to achieve system level results. Three, how to incorporate commitments and ambition on intersecting social and environmental issues that affect our ability to reach climate change goals. From these key questions, we created our necessary action metrics. These metrics were developed through a review of current literature on climate science, net zero trajectories, and analysis undertaken by sectoral experts. As a result, the necessary action metrics are aligned with the level of ambition necessary to meet global climate and sustainability targets. In the framework, we start with our necessary action metrics and then compare them to the observed current leading practices by coalitions and initiatives on climate action across three main categories. In our opinion, financial institutions should be one, setting targets, both for net zero by 2050 and complementary sustainable development goals, and that's shown on the slide above. Two, implementing programs and initiatives that actively contribute to the net zero pathway. And three, publicly disclosing their activities, risks, and emissions. Next slide, please. Our analysis is based on understanding existing commitments and requirements from coalitions across both the public and private sectors. It builds on the work of these existing initiatives, creating universally applicable metrics that are aligned with the level of ambition necessary to meet global climate and sustainability targets. As you can see on the timeline, there have been a significant number of coalitions and enabling initiatives in the past several years. While we weren't able to examine every initiative, we successfully examined the relevant net zero coalitions under the GFANS umbrella for the private sector and examined a number of membership coalitions and sign on initiatives for the public sector. Next slide, please. As part of the framework, we analyze current commitments for our subset of coalitions and institutions across the financial sector. Each coalition has been assessed against the necessary action metrics and observed to be either A, aligned with necessary action, B, making progress towards necessary action, C, partially aligned with necessary action, or D, not aligned with necessary action. And you can see the dark green on the slide represents aligned with necessary action, going all the way to gray, which is not aligned with necessary action. Because we are examining a broad field, some necessary action metrics will be less relevant for certain actors than for others. Additionally, we were only able to evaluate whether the commitment has been made by the coalition and not whether it is currently on track to be fulfilled. That said, there's an interesting spread of commitments across the metrics, um, with a handful of coalitions reaching the requirements we set out for a few of the necessary action metrics that you can see again in dark green. But there are also many more metrics where additional guidance from coalitions would be useful in driving ambition. You can see that again, yellow and gray that you see throughout the chart above. We see the framework and this analysis as a tool for coalitions and initiatives to evaluate their ambition and coordinate across the financial sector. Next slide. So finally, we also see the framework as a focal point for fostering the additional collaboration needed across the financial sector and will initiate opportunities for some of that cross coalition building in 2022. So please keep an eye out for either invitations or future information in the space. And with that, I'll turn it back to Dan and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thanks so very much. It's clear we've got some themes emerging um, that I think again are really uh, what's gonna be the story of COP26. And that is the need to follow the science, to be analytically rigorous, and to be careful and structured in how we pursue the decarbonization agenda and how we encourage the flows of private capital as well as public monies to really produce what's required in the way of investment in clean energy. So thank you, Nicole. You've put um, a good bit of uh, additional material on the table for all of us to think through. With that, I'd like to turn to Rajat Panwar, who's a professor at Oregon State University. And he is, uh, his expertise and his focus and his conversation today will be at the intersection of sustainable business and resources. So with that, Raja, the virtual microphone is yours. You are still muted, Raja. We're gonna need to unmute you. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much. It is 9 a.m. here in Oregon. So good morning to, to everyone from my side. Um, I will be sharing my screen, in fact, so let's do it this way. Um, I've titled my, my uh, brief presentation such that it captures the core message that I intend to deliver. Uh, and yes, now. Um, um, and you will also note that the title is so 
is also inspired by the title of the seminal work that uh, that Dan Esty, our moderator, did in 2010 when he wrote this wonderful paper that came out in Harvard Business Review titled The Sustainability Imperative. So I wish to add just a little bit of a, a new angle to that call. But let me begin with introducing a question that has consumed academics as well as the policy experts alike for the past three decades. And, uh, and the question is how to mobilize businesses for sustainability. I recognize, and as you will, that, uh, that most of the heavy lifting in this question is done by the word mobilization, because it may, of course, be interpreted in a, in a wide variety of ways. But, uh, but in at least two prom prominent ways, the mobilization has happened that are outlined here. Over 90% of the world's largest companies, quote unquote, embrace sustainability as is, as is, uh, as is evident by a, a, a myriad range of uh, reporting initiatives and, and frameworks and all that. And, uh, and secondly, also green investments have been rising. The, the, there is a quadrant though. At the same time, the environment continues to be in a state of unabated decline by any measure you, you may choose to pick. In fact, uh, we have done quite poorly, even on the carbon emissions front, that has been the main focus. Uh, 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 as, as, as you would note, more than half of the carbon dioxide emissions since the industrial revolution have occurred in just last three decades, which one could call the golden era of corporate sustainability. So the question I raise and some of my colleagues join me in raising is why the disconnect is between these, uh, this proliferation of corporate sustainability on one hand and, and, and environmental degradation on the other. So why is this disconnect and how do we fix it? Well, there, there could be at least two ways and, uh, and they are complementary, of course, not exclusive or, or oppositional to each other. The first is what, what I call the ramping up view and ramping up view is essentially that, well, let's keep doing more of what we have been doing, of course, with some, some marginal improvements. And that is the, the, uh, the um, I would say, the, the, uh, the, the, the central message of uh, uh, climate finance field is that we need more money. It is very well reflected and very well captured by, by this quote that Sean Kidney, the, the CEO of Climate Bonds Initiative made rather recently, the long awaited 1 trillion milestone is now a market reality soon. What, what Sean and very understandably is calling for is that we need five trillions in, 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 in the coming uh, rather soon. So this is the ramping up view. I take a rather, a rather different approach, uh, what I call the revamping view that what we have been doing needs to be fundamentally changed. And, uh, and we recently published this, this uh, 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 perspective piece in Stanford Social Innovation Review called the Reori uh, Reorient the Business Case for Corporate Sustainability. I will read a rather dramatic uh, 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 way how we ended the article. We say this, the massive growth of corporate sustainability programs under the business case is actually not benign. We think it, it has a cancerous characteristic to it. The longer it metastizes and continues to crowd out healthier interventions, we, which we spell out in the paper, the greater the risk that it will kill our prospects of pulling back from environmental disasters. In other ways, we are actually calling for revamping. We say that the current uh, focus is uh, the current environmental initiatives are, are narrow in scope. They are beguiling in nature and they are shallow in reach. As a remedy, we say that corporate responsibility needs authenticity, hence the authenticity imperative. Uh, we say that we need to be measuring impact, not output, something that, that Pankaj alluded to in, in his uh, guidance, uh, the, his foreshadowing the guidance document that is coming out. Secondly, we also emphasize in the paper that we ought to be more inclusive. Currently, what we behold, and, and I do fundamentally believe in this, that, that the that the COP26, including and, and broader uh, climate initiatives are just usurped by this Western paradigm that, that we can consume our way out of the sustainability, uh, of unsustainability. And that brings to the third point that we make is that we need to, to, to understand the, the, uh, the limits here and, and pursue degrowth. But the question that, that is of uh, immediate interest to me in, in the last few, few weeks or so, and which is something that, that I wrote about in SDG Action is how do these quote unquote inauthentic solutions emerge and sustain? Well, we all have heard about greenwashing. Uh, and, and, and so I won't talk much about that. The second reason for, for this to happen is that uh, what I call output impact fallacy. Companies are doing a lot, 
um, on, on attributional fronts, but not uh, um, assessing the, the consequences. Again, something that, that I'm happy uh, Pankaj talked about that WRI is doing something to, to, to address is that, uh, that it will uh, be interested in uh, assessing impacts. Finally, scientific manipulation, something that I do see as an academic happen uh, over and over and again. And so this is what I wrote in SDG action and the, uh, the, 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 the three remedies for this that I'm suggesting is that we need more scientific veracity, not, not, not just this superficial narrow scope science. Courageous researcher, and I also call for, for an independent panel by the United Nations that can actually verify the claims that corporations and corporate sponsored uh, uh, environmental initiatives make. How would authenticity look in action is also something that I would like to talk about uh, just, just a, 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 in a minute or so. I, just yesterday, I, I uh, uh, contributed this commentary on this wonderful topic that a lot of us are very excited about these, uh, these days in the journal Business and Society, where I talk about how to avoid a net zero debacle. And so I give there these three basic uh, recommendation. One, scope three initiatives are inefficient, sorry, insufficient, and we need uh, to develop scope three plans. Here by scope three, I, I bring in the element of uh, somehow reducing overall, overall consumption. Second is do not clean wash. That is that these, these removal projects, a lot of those are, are out there and they are riddled with, with myriad limitations and actually adverse impacts, which I can talk about later if, if the chance is given. And finally, that not only uh, corporate initiatives need to cultivate market support, but corporations ought to also be pushing for regulations. And so in, 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 uh, in summary then, the authenticity imperative that I'm proposing uh, uh, at, uh, at the pretext of this confer uh, conference, yes, I do recognize, and we all do recognize that increasing climate finances is, is important, very important, but making good on this rhetoric is, I think, critical. So when everybody is talking about, and, and I am uh, uh, with, with, with the gang there, that this is a decade of action, I think that we ought to emphasize that this should be the decade of authentic action, not just action. We have seen enough of this movie for three decades. So I asked for paradigm change, inclusive approaches. I will talk about that just for one second in the conclusion. Comprehensive slash consequential impact assessments, again, going back to what Pankaj uh, was talking about, and indeed prog progressive lobbying. By inclusive approaches, and this is something that I want to, to, to be the core of my talk today, is that we have done enough of this, uh, this uh, um, uh, finance-backed and, and consumption-driven uh, sustainability, and I think we ought to recognize that, uh, that there are limits to growth. With that said, thank you very much for the opportunity, and I will stop sharing, and I hope then I am on time. Rajat, thank you so very much. Um, I want to add to our core concepts of the day, which I think reflect the concepts of the week uh, at COP26, authenticity. I think there is a, a recognized need now to move from talk to action. And uh, it's not enough to make a, a promise, not enough to make a pledge. Uh, the game plan for follow through is critical and then measuring that follow through. And I think that is really emerging. Um, I want to mention two more things before I turn to Martha, our final speaker. Um, and first is that we will be moving into a question and answer mode. And if you've got questions you'd like me to put to the panel, either to all of them or to one, uh, please do uh, use uh, the Q&A function uh, on our Zoom webinar, and I will pick those up and put them to the, uh, the panel. I also want to mention that the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, our host for this uh, webinar today, has produced a very thoughtful set of essays in what they call the climate action edition of the SDG, SDG action. And I'm gonna have our SDSN team drop the, uh, the link into the chat so all of you can find these um, essays, uh, which launched on Friday, uh, bringing forward a whole series of materials that really try to provide practical recommendations from a wide array of perspectives from global leaders uh, in the business world, in academia, in politics, in civil society. And I think frankly, taken as a whole, the collection lays out a roadmap for the action required for deep decarbonization. Of course, it's uh, uh, put out to the world right as the uh, COP26 conversation is beginning. 
But I think the SDSN um, work uh, over the past year to pull this together, really 50 different leading policymakers contributing their thinking uh, does represent uh, an important step forward in terms of laying down a foundation on which uh, the global community can build as it moves forward on this uh, enormous challenge. So with that, let me turn, if I could, please, um, to Martha McPherson. Martha is a sustainability director at a consultancy called Design Portfolio. She is also a visiting policy fellow at the uh, UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Uh, Martha, the virtual microphone is yours. Thank you so much, Dan. Thanks everyone for setting this up so well. Um, just to start out, I mean, this is a huge topic. Um, I know that not all of us have the answers, but I really do want to be as discursive and as challenging as possible. I want to have questions asked to me that I can't answer and say, sorry. <laughs> so please do throw those at us, audience. Um, it needs to be as discursive and as disruptive as possible. Um, but I'm going to start um, by getting everyone excited about corporate reporting. Um, this feels like a relatively easy audience to get excited about. It's not always the case. Um, what we do at Design Portfolio is we are one of the UK's biggest corporate reporting, digital and sustainability consultancies. We work with people all over the world, so I'm always getting stuck into international uh, regulation. Um, but corporate reporting, annual reporting, quarterly reporting, investor showcases and roadshows are hyper relevant both to the SDGs and climate finance. And I'm going to be talking a bit about both. And I use the word hyper in a very meaningful way because it is all about the hype. It is all about the comms. It is all about showing off what you've done and what you're aiming to do. Um, but we need to dig beneath that and get into from strategy, uh, sorry, from compliance into strategy, from um, thinking about ticking the boxes into designing sustainability into your business models from the start. Um, so annual reporting, sorry, next slide, please. So this is, oh, this is, we've got a bit of a, a kind of um, issue here on, on uh, outline, but I'll, I'll just work through it. Um, Annual reporting lays out kind of company financials, their risks, their strategies, their assets, their burning business opportunities once a year. Um, this is the substance of what is material to a company. It provides the inputs for indices all over the world. And most importantly, it is the starting point for investors. It's the first thing they visit. And so for the SDG Climate Action Report, um, I took a look at where SDG reporting currently stands. And it's in a really interesting middle ground. I wanted to share some of these insights with you. Um, so firstly, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, companies and the business world really like this framework. It's appealing, it feels holistic. It intersects with them on a global supply chain and a kind of globalized level. Um, bigger companies really can understand how they might be able to influence infrastructure um, and decent work across the world. And it's had a huge amount of traction actually for something that is not internationally um, mandated as a reporting requirement. So just in the first two years that the SDGs were launched, 43% uh, of companies in the top 250 in Europe were already connecting business models to the SDGs. And we can talk about how meaningfully this was done, um, but it's, it's about uh, in the kind of groundswell of, of bringing that up into your business model in the first instance. And then there's a lot of way to go. And it's really worth saying that smaller companies don't often feel the same way. It's much harder for smaller companies to really see how they can be influencing infrastructure, influencing resilience. I have a lot of smaller companies as clients who really can't quite see how their connection is made with the SDGs and through to SDG 13. Um, and then secondly, as with everything, the SDGs are competing uh, on uh, with, with other mandatory requirements for company time, for company energy. These are not mandatory. Um, and the kind of uh, there are other things going on. You have um, uh, energy, energy reporting, carbon emissions, uh, diversity reporting, accident reporting. These are things that take up company time in the first instance. So I think a recommendation would be that it's, it's really important to move SDGs closer to this mandatory space um, and so that it can be properly audited. Um, but then a converse point here is that it can feel quite easy to align quite badly and quite quickly with the SDGs. There are the top level of the SDGs are to some degree quite difficult to disagree with. There's a question here around economic growth that I'm very keen to kind of discuss further under one of the SDGs, but a lot of them do feel like motherhood and apple pie. Companies look at them and they think, you know, we, we can happily align with that. And they don't go down to that second level to the deep sub indicators um, that are much more difficult to align with. So you're looking at things like 13.1, 7.2, how can companies legitimately claim to, for example, for 13.1, strengthen resilience and adaptive cap capacity to climate related hazards and natural disasters in all countries. That's very difficult for companies to kind of really realize their, their deep and true alignment. And then the third trend I see here is that it's quite easy to cop out. 
some of the SDGs are more inherently business friendly than others. I'm thinking number eight, number nine, number 11. It's very easy to think that as an existing company providing decent work, you've aligned with the SDGs, you've done enough. And that is not in the spirit of pushing forward, of, of progressing to achieve the goals. So I think there's some real work to be done to ensure that SDGs are not they, they don't move fully into being a pure compliance tick box me mechanism, but they actually start creating, you know, decision useful questions at the heart of companies. Next slide, please. And the reason this is important to climate finance and to, to finance in general is that disclosure and reporting are at the heart of access to capital. Investors are increasingly savvy. Um, they're not going to take greenwashing or rainbow washing anymore. Um, activist investors are increasingly posing challenges that they win. Um, and the kind of issue here with corporate reporting is actually reporting is often kind of backward looking when it comes to thinking about, you know, setting strategy. It doesn't feel like it's on the front foot. But actually, the reason that it's really important to engage here is that it is that time of the year when companies are forced to get past the auditors and get past their, their C-suite, everything that they've done over the course of the year and everything that they've achieved. Um, and so the kind of coalition, the coalescence around um, an annual report as a key document here, I think is a really important leverage point. Um, and the approach that we take at Design Portfolio is very much, yes, get compliance right, that's what annual reporting is for, um, but the real value add and innovation add of sustainability come when it's properly baked into business models from the off, so that you don't have to kind of go back and re -re reorient what you were doing in the first place. It's about designing business models for the green transition, rather than limiting the ambition of the green transition to the business models that you already have. And I think as we work as well with smaller and smaller companies that are just starting up, you see them you know, doing SDGs by design, doing sustainability as they're becoming incorporated, not later. Next slide, please. And this is just a bit of a backdrop. We all know this, but you know, the reason that investors are more aware and that companies are more aware as well is that we all are. Um, these are all headlines from the last year. Um, TCFD is running uh, straight up the, the flagpole. We all know about COP, we all know about the European Green Deal, but how does it actually impact companies? And businesses need now to recognize that wider suite of stakeholders. In the UK, stakeholder reporting, so reporting on how you're engaging with different types of stakeholders, is increasingly tight, increasingly stringent, and investors are asking questions about how do you engage with your employees, with people down your supply chain that you're not necessarily in, in direct contact with. Um, and all of these people are reading these newspapers too. Um, so it's, it's really important. We often talk to companies who are setting up a net zero strategy and I will ask, how do your employees feel about that? And they won't quite know because they haven't realized that those stakeholders are all reading these newspapers too. Um, there's a stat that came out in the UK uh, the other day and I really like this. It said that 70% of the UK, so this is a, came out of the, the, business, um, uh, the business ministry that said that 70% of, of men in the UK, a little bit less for women, had actually heard of net zero as a concept. They'd already heard of it. They claimed that they knew what it meant. Um, and that's, for me, I, I was surprised because net zero is my kind of day-to-day -day bread and butter. But the idea that 70% of people or men knew what that is, they are already engaging in this discussion. They are, the stakeholders are already becoming aware. So you ignore them at your peril because these are your employees. These are, your, these are, these are the, the people that bring the value to the work. Last slide, please. And I'll just finish with a couple of examples and then a call to action. So. I've spoken about where things have not been quite right, have not been gelling necessarily in reporting and how companies kind of approach the SDGs. I'm thinking of the SDGs as a proxy for climate because it's very, very familiar. Um, my work on the day-to-day -day is all about ESG, which is a very difficult topic um, that has had a lot of kind of bashing recently for, and rightly so. Um, but there are some really good examples, both in the public space and the private space that deserve a bit of a shout out and, and kind of modeling uh, of, of initiatives around. What I haven't worked on, but really like is from the Welsh government. So the, I, you will have come across this, I think, the Commission for the Wellbeing of Future Generations, which is completely SDG framed. Um, it's a revolutionary approach in inside government that brings the voice of young and unborn people into that long term decision making. Um, this is huge. This is a very, very different way of assessing what companies are intending to do, what kind of infrastructure is intending to be built. And what I have worked on, and I'll wrap up really quickly, is via the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose um, with the Biscay Regional Government in Northern Spain. They are working to develop the world's first local corporate tax policy that's aligned with the SDGs. This is, has been developed uh, in collaboration with local business, uh, reporting in the region, with uh, SDG research community, with universities, and kind of gets to the heart of uh, supercharging company reporting, pushing companies to disclose further than they would before, um, and at that to do so at that unique sub-indicator level, so really meaningful disclosures. And my kind of question is, how can we make these kinds of co-created processes, the norm for the SDGs and for climate, linking them all the way through to finance. 
Um, and how can we kind of just support that promise that sits under the SDGs to build out a green transition in the way that we want, rather than have it kind of almost backwards built into incumbent business models? I'll stop there. Martha, thank you very much. You've again given us some really important concepts to work with, not the least of which I think is the idea we need disruptive change. It's not going to be enough to uh, kind of continue as business as usual or even just slightly ramped up. We need transformative change in fundamental ways. I also um, think that your emphasis on the need for corporate action could emerge as the story of uh, COP26. I think governments continue to struggle. Uh, certainly in the United States, the Biden administration is trying, but has a, a difficult Congress to work with. I think the same story is playing out in other countries. So it may well fall to the business world to step up to um, the challenges and, uh, and certainly to flow the capital that's required for what we uh, have all been talking about is in terms of what's needed for deep decarbonization. I'm gonna move now to some specific questions to our various panelists, but I invite any of you in the audience who have uh, issues on your mind to drop a question in the, uh, the Q&A function. And I will try to pull some of those up uh, and put them to our panel as well. Pankaj, I'm gonna start with you. I wanna take you back to the greenhouse gas protocol. And I'm interested in how that protocol um, approaches the financial sector. And I know you've got some thinking about uh, what you can do in terms of refreshing this and, uh, and pushing the finance world to, uh, to align with you in trying to get uh, not only accurate reporting, but the trends moving in the right direction. So Pankaj, what's your, your uh, thinking about this and what can you tell us about what the protocol is going to do? <clears throat> Thank you, Dan, and, and please feel free to come in because I have so much to share that sometimes I might lose track of time. Just on the financial sector, and also listening to all the great panelists here, it's really an inspiring set of panelists. Uh, congratulations to SDSN. Um, I, I, I think uh, the, some of these topics require much longer conversations and dialogue. Uh, I, I think uh, the greenhouse gas protocol has seen a, a long history, more than 20 years. Uh, first standard came out in 2001, then 2004, 2007, 2011. And so in uh, next year, we are planning to do a comprehensive refresh. Um, some of the standards are more than 20 years old, uh, some more than 20, 10 years old, and many new accounting issues that have been identified that we understand now have to be addressed. But one of the most important issue that I think we as a community, you know, I think the global community needs to come together on is um, to <clears throat> require scope three reporting, which was when originally published in 2004, the scope three reporting was optional. It was a great innovation to introduce the concepts of scope one, two, and three. And at that time, scope three was considered optional because companies were still learning how to undertake the supply chain value chain assessment. I think now the world has moved uh, quite, quite far in terms of the journey, this journey and progress, and also the challenges. And I think that one of the major refresh would be to require scope three reporting so that companies, you know, even now, companies would go back to the corporate standard and say that they are in compliance with the GHG protocol and they don't report scope three emissions. I don't know if you, if, um, in some of the companies on gas sector companies, if I go to their website, I don't find their scope three information. I don't find their product use phase emissions. And so I think this is going to be one major refresh and it, it links to then also the financial sector. In the financial sector, we, we have introduced a, a methodology. Actually, we worked in partnership with uh, Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, PCAF. And PCAF methodology has been adopted by GHG protocol. It went through a GHG protocol review process. And under this, one of the major requirements is that financial institutions should be reporting under scope three category number 15, which is investment category. They should be reporting uh, their greenhouse gas emissions associated with six asset classes uh, that includes listed equity and, and corporate bonds, uh, business loans, uh, unlisted equity, commercial real estate, mortgages, project finance, and also um, loans. So uh, now in practice, how many of them are doing? I think it has to be seen, uh, but in, in summary, I think to your question, Dan, that this is a very good method which has been published now. 
And we would like to see the financial sector adopts it. They use it to set their science-based target setting goals. And we will integrate it into uh, the GAG protocol family of standards during this refresh process, we will make a full integration so that scope three will be seen as a required category. And particularly, I think it will be identified that oil and gas sector and financial sector and similar sectors have to report on scope three. Also, I think we will cover the system impacts because in some sectors, uh, companies could be making great progress uh, in within their value chain, but then it might be at the cost of a broader impacts uh, and that's why I think it is important now that we, we, we are in a globally connected world and we have to, I, I think this uh, idea of global minimum tax, even in financial accounting, it is possible to find loopholes. And, and this, they have much longer history, hundreds of years it took to perfect the rules around financial accounting. GHG accounting rulemaking started in 1998 with GHG protocol. It has been 23 years. And we need to perfect that, but there are loopholes. And I think one of the loopholes is this, this uh, global systemic impacts. And we need to consider how to, how to fix that hole also. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Pankaj. There's so much there. And uh, I, I really do um, like to hear that there's a, a refresh coming because I think it'll help ensure that the uh, protocol is seen as moving with the times. Uh, and steering people as it has for so long, but now in more urgent ways, including around those scope three emissions that I think we've seen the panel fully agree uh, needs to be part of the story here. Nicole, I want to um, actually get you to respond to Rajat's idea of authenticity. And I want to um, press you as to whether some of the commitments being made from the finance world um, are as full and complete and uh, to use Rajat's word as authentic as we need. And I raise it particularly because the conversation uh, not inside um, the discussion uh, at COP26, but just outside includes a number of campaigners of uh, various environmental groups really calling out the finance world for not stepping up and not being uh, frankly authentic in um, their suggestions that they're taking on the need to address sustainability broadly, uh, align with the SDGs in particular, and frankly, deliver the capital for uh, the transformation of the, of the greenhouse gas emissions world that we're facing. So what do you say to those in the, in the streets uh, outside us in Glasgow who are saying that um, these protocols and structures, uh, the efforts that people are bringing forward uh, in the finance world just aren't enough, and in some cases just aren't real? You know, that's a really good question on both points. And to the people in the streets, um, I definitely think that they're bringing a really great point to the table, which is in part that everything that we're hearing so far is really a commitment. At times, it's just a commitment to make a commitment. Um, but because we are, we're not early in the climate conversion, but the financial sector is in part early in its path on the transition. So a lot of times what we're hearing is, we intend to do this in 20 years. We intend to do this in 10 years. Um, and it's really a question of what are you doing now to integrate that into your processes? Um, you know, one of our metrics is called mainstreaming. What are you doing to really bring this into your, your institution to make sure that climate damage is, sustainability is really integrated throughout every process and that it's involved in every decision? And I think that that's something we still need to see. And this kind of gets to Martha's point as well about reporting what's visible from a company, what's not. And I'd love to hear her thoughts on this as well. But I think that when it comes to people being frustrated with the progress that financial institutions have made, the truth is that there's such a wide scope of what financial institutions are doing. You have a handful that are actually coming out with, um, commitments, requirements that are, you know, meeting what we classified as necessary action. And then you have others that are dragging their feet visibly and really trying to slow things down, talking about shareholder value, really trying to pull in this idea of, you know, oh, it's still appropriate to finance coal up until 2050 because that's an area that we see as growth or, you know, we see returns coming from that. So the truth is, is that by lumping the entire financial sector together, you are getting the whole mix of some institutions that are making great progress and so many others that are just really far behind. 
There's also the issue, just to add this one other flavor in as well, that um, there's such a big difference between the developing economies, institutions, and developed economies that is often overlooked. And what we're getting is that a lot of times sort of developed economies, European westernized approaches are saying, well, we're absolutely going to do this. And then developing economies are saying, we're still on step one. And now all of a sudden you're expecting us to be on step seven and we can't make this, we can't bridge this gap. You're not letting us into the club. You're not helping us get across this bridge that we need to get to you know, access the capital that you're offering. So I think that that's also something that needs to be taken into account, but in no way is that intended to give an escape route to any of the you know, US or European institutions that are really dragging their feet and just um, focusing on short-term value instead of long-term value. Um, with that, actually, I, I wanna jump, Nicole, from your, uh, your push on that to Rajat. And, uh, and, and ask you, Rajat, you're um, raising this question of auth authenticity. And I think um, to Nicole's point, there are lots of folks uh, in uh, Glasgow, some who've done this before Glasgow, some who will do it here in Glasgow, some who will do it uh, in the weeks that follow. But we have not only countries making net zero commitments, um, and uh, in some cases stepping up in a way that's quite remarkable given where they were. I, I call out in that regard, uh, India's commitment uh, that Prime Minister Modi announced yesterday. Some are saying, well, it's 2070, that's too late, too far. But frankly, given where India was, this is a big step forward. And, and I think so far, one of the big accomplishments of this gathering. Um, and it is the case that the, the COP process does provide an action forcing moment. And people like Prime Minister Modi don't wanna show up with nothing to say uh, or, or look like they're foot dragging. So I, I do think that's a big deal. But Raja, my question for you is the other piece of this, which is the hundreds, indeed, I think by the end of the event, thousands of companies that will be making net zero greenhouse gas emissions pledges of one kind or another. And my question to you is, how do we uh, sort out what's real and authentic, to use your word, uh, in the regard to those pledges from that, which is just um, uh, happy talk? Or worse yet, in some cases, uh, we might even call it greenwashing, people making claims that they don't intend to follow through on or may in fact be untrue. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, thank you very much, Dan. And yes, I agree that, uh, that uh, the uh, commitment that India's Prime Minister Modi made the other day um, is, is, is certainly a, a very encouraging thing for, for uh, uh, not only um, us as Indians, but also for, for many other emerging economies to emulate. So thank you for bringing that up. Your question about authenticity, how do we know? To be honest, um, um, uh, the, the presentations made by Pankaj, Nicole, and Martha have given me already some clues as to what that authenticity might look like in practice. I particularly like what uh, WRI has, uh, and, um, um, that has uh, Pankaj articulated this, this idea of what I would call kind of like an augmented framework in which they are moving away from simply actions to impact and simply from inventories slash uh, uh, attributions to, uh, to consequences. So I think that is one clear step. I think scope three or uh, net zero uh, reporting, I think that they should have a clear impact orientation as to what a company's action would look like on, 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 the, on, the, on the systems level. I have had extensive conversations with lots of uh, employees and, and other stakeholders in my work during last five, six years. And they ask this question all the time that I'm all on board with what my company is doing. I am all in support. I just don't know how will it change the world. And I asked them the follow-up question, why would it not? And so the, the, the answer is that, well, there will be an undercutter somewhere else in the world and they will start actually doing what we will undo. So it's a net zero sum game and that we will only harm the interests of the companies. So if hundreds and thousands of those companies, uh, then they, they start to adopt the framework that, that, uh, that, uh, that are being developed currently, then I think that would be a clear sign of going towards more the authentic and, and delivery side of thing rather than, rather than, just, uh, uh, rather than just, just happy talks, as you said. So that would be my uh, that would be my uh, litmus test for it that we need to put these augmented frameworks in uh, in in in, uh, in practice. Um, thank you, Rajat. Martha, I'd like to ask you the same question. 
Um, uh, what is uh, going to allow us to separate, and you deal with this all the time in your work with companies, what's going to allow us to separate real sustainability leadership alignment with SDGs, not just a, a, a net zero commitment on greenhouse gases? What's going to really separate those kind of corporate serious uh, initiatives and efforts from uh, what might be the inauthentic alternative? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the first thing to say is that comparison is authentic. As soon as you have a direct way of comparing, you are looking at, you know, like for like across the world. And I think this point about integrated frameworks is made a lot, um, but I think it's I think it's true. And I think I, I see a lot of people who are coming at this from the other side, my clients, they don't understand which frameworks they should be reporting to. And every time a new, there's been so many fantastic new kind of developed uh, augmented frameworks just shared today. And I know that these are bamboozling <laughs> to the people that um, haven't aren't in this on the day to day. And a lot of companies will have a fantastic, you know, head of sustainability and a suite of people supporting them. But actually a lot of the world's assets will be looked after by the company secretary or someone who has this as currently side of desk. Um, or, and it's really important to remember that when we talk about climate, we're thinking about quite a lot of resource that we've seen put behind it. But for a lot of companies, and there's a question in the chat actually about um, SMEs and smaller companies, um, which make up a huge amount of different economies and informal economies as a whole nother level, if you want to add that, um, for a lot of organizations, they, you know, they are not speaking in this jargon, this language every day, um, and they don't have the resource that we might want or expect them to have. This will change. Um, we are seeing many more kind of um, chief sustainability officers. Uh, we are seeing an absolute glut in the, in the hiring, but at the same time, Nicole's made the point that we are early in the climate journey relatively, and the amount of, of skills and development that um, employees in the space have needs to really augment itself and, and, and rapidly upskill. Um, if you want to hire someone great in sustainability, you go to Glasgow right now, um, you know, steal them from somewhere because that is what, what we really need to be doing. Um, but your question as well is, what it, how do we get to authenticity at the heart of this? And I think there's two ways in. One um, is going back to the question of materiality. And it's been a question that's been bandied around for a long time. When we start talking with businesses, we say, don't just look for the shiny, glittery GRI, SASB prizes you want to win. What is it on a day-to-day -day basis of a long list of climate-related and ESG-related issues that is genuinely material on a day-to-day -to, -day to your business that you can have an impact on, that you think is significant, that your internal and external stakeholders think is significant, and that is, is you know, engaging policy, engaging investors? What are investors going to ask questions about? How can we you know, use this process to educate them to ask those questions? So undertaking a materiality assessment that your investors can hold you to account on and informing them about that is hugely important. I think the companies that are doing that, um, especially in the kind of uh, secondary leader space, you know, you've got the leaders of the world that are, have, have led the charge, but those secondary leaders, um, the ones that are doing that and are asked being, you know, asked to be asking to be held to account, that's where I think we do start to see authenticity. But it's not clear cut. The litmus test is not binary. I don't think it's there yet. So we do need comparison. Uh, Martha, thank you very much. I'm going to now turn to some of the questions that have started to accumulate in our Q&A uh, platform. And for those who've got further questions, please do put them into the Q&A and not into the chat, in fact. Um, so let me start with uh, uh, a point, really, Martha, you've raised, and I think I've actually a number of panelists have raised, which is the need for alignment across uh, initiatives and, frankly, across institutional efforts. Uh, and Aaron has put a question in concerned about the global trading system and whether uh, it has a, a misalignment, perhaps, with the decarbonization agenda that the uh, COP26 and all of us are focused on today. And we're, of course, trying to make sure the finance world more broadly is aligned with the decarbonization agenda. But what about this prospect that uh, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, or those engaged in the trade uh, uh, in, in the trading system more broadly are frankly not attending to the global commitments on uh, decarbonization and perhaps are in, in fact advancing uh, the agenda of, uh, of global commerce in a way that will detract from rather than advance uh, the efforts that all of us gathered for COP26 are trying to focus on, which is to get uh, the world on a clean energy trajectory and move away from uh, the fossil fuel dependence uh, of recent decades. Um, I come back really quickly just on that one because- okay, Please, Martha, yes, I was about to say- whoever... <laughs> I know I've just spoken, but I've nope. ju I'm just writing a paper at the moment with a, a colleague from the UN World Food Programme, and we're talking about nature-related risk and the, um, the multilateral approach to it, and that the WTO is a really interesting starting point. 
just because they've done some preparatory work on nature related risk, linking it very much within climate action. But the actual stance they adopt is very vague. And I'll just read it out for you as a kind of starting point for, for this trade discussion. They say environmental standards can impede international trade and even be used as an excuse for protectionism. The answer is not to weaken environmental standards, but to set appropriate standards and enable exporters to meet them. I mean, that's very, very light touch, I would say. Thank you for starting that uh, discussion out. I, by the way, have launched a, an initiative at Yale called Remaking the Global Trading System for a Sustainable Future, because I think it's not just environmental standards that are an issue, but frankly, the rules and practices of the trading system are an issue. So we need this alignment to go both ways. Rajat, I think I saw you um, signaling some interest here. So let me invite you to make a comment. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um and not to not to pitch an anti-globalization idea here, but uh, but the one of the main reason for misalignment occurs from the the opaqueness in these global supply chains. Uh, some of my own work has shown that in some cases it is literally impossible to to find out who your suppliers are, and so though that that directly contradicts the idea of uh, scope three emissions reduction and control when you cannot even find. And in fact, not just my work, but, but academic literature broadly speaking is replete with findings that finding who actually manufactured and who sourced the product can become very tedious jobs in, in forestry sector where I work quite intensively uh, and, and which is quite, quite, quite a, a uh, kind of like a model um, sector for, for a variety of reasons, historical as well as contemporary uh, environmental standards are quite high. But even in this sector, we do see infiltration of uh, of lot of uh, uh, illegally supplied wood that infiltrate even such mature markets as the United States, where there are uh, not only uh, uh, regulations in place, but also companies are quite vigilant as well as resourceful to to combat that. So global trade has certainly served some some uh, some uh, inbuilt uh, uh, attributes in it that can that can inhibit uh, this this alignment. Well, I want to take us from uh, the trading system to an even bigger topic, which is um, capitalism broadly. Uh, is there a misalignment? Toscanil is raising the prospect that we may need to switch from capitalism to uh, an alternative approach to economics, social enterprise, or microfinance. And I guess the question really is, would those alternative ways of framing how commerce moves forward uh, help us in getting a flow of capital? You know, I guess myself, I don't think the prospect of taking down capitalism to achieve climate change is a, is a good answer because it might take a long time to get there. But I do think adding on some social enterprise, I think we see a, a set of finance uh, interests that have, value, have decided they are values oriented and want to be impact investors, trying to make sure they're um, not just uh, earning a profit, but helping to change the world. That seems useful. Microfinance seems useful. But do any of you have a thought on uh, on Toscanil's question? I can start if everyone please, else is. Please jump right in, Nicole. Excellent. So I think that there's there's multiple parts of this, and one of them is a question of you know moving from capitalism to social enterprise or microfinance. I think there's absolutely benefits of microfinance, as particularly in developing countries, um, and particularly in achieving the SDGs. That said, I think that there's definitely a role for regulators to play, both in the US, which I have the most experience in, and globally, in creating a system that also encourages or even requires um, social goals and social benefits to come through capitalistic enterprises. I'm not saying that's the absolute answer, but I'm saying that's absolutely something that could help in this process. In terms of investors, especially ESG investors and activist investors, I've had the pleasure of working with some, some truly out there and avant-garde investors in the past. And it's really wonderful to see them go and hold a company's feet to the fire. And even if that progress is incredibly incremental at times and incredibly frustrating for the investors involved, you know, you would not be seeing nearly as much progress, particularly on things like oil and gas companies in the US without having some investors who are very engaged, extremely involved, and really taking the time and effort to ensure that um, their votes and their money are heard within the companies. And so I think that in terms of just capitalism, there's a lot of options there to look at as well. Do any of the rest of you want to uh, supplement uh, that thought? 
Thank yes. You. Thank you, Dan. Um, I just wanted to maybe <clears throat> bring also our attention to one very important issue, uh, which is our financing. Uh, so we financing particularly in, in uh, uh, developing countries, uh, poor countries that don't have resources yet to combat uh, the impact of climate change. And in, in some of the economies, even with, given their development goals, I think like India announced net zero by 2070, means why should that be the case that 20 years more or 30 years more? And clearly I think financing is one of the issues. And I, I, I think, uh, I don't have a answer directly to this issue of switching from capitalism but certainly I think there is a relevant point that if capitalism is only driven by profit mo motive, then it, it doesn't present a case that why should companies uh, invest in, in developing countries uh, to achieve uh, both perhaps their business objectives, but also social objectives and to contribute, for example, to uh, achieve greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas reductions in those countries. Now in the, in the GHG protocol, we are first time introducing a new reporting category, which kind of goes against the basic uh, motivation of capitalism. Uh, and this category is, if, if, if successful, if this is going to be a placeholder for companies to report uh, their financing to enable a meeting of goals by others. So not by, not their goals, but their financing that contributes to reducing emissions by other players. And, and we would like to track that progress on a regular basis. I think it is very important because unless there, there is a redirection of finance uh, flows to developing countries, uh, we are likely going to continue to miss the uh, deadlines that we always set for ourselves and, and we are not seeing the successes that we need. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other thoughts? If yeah. not, Go ahead, please jump right in, Martha. Sure, I'm happy to. I think this question of remaking, rethinking, redefining capitalism is, is the one that's huge. Um, I've spent time working at the Institute of Innovation and Public Purpose with Mariana Mazzucato. So my quest, my approach to this is very much in that field of pluralist economics approaches, less about remaking capitalism potentially, but more about thinking, rethinking the value equations that sit underneath it. What, how do we get to the question of, of what, uh, what is the value of the assets that we care about that we choose to invest in? So this is how can we better value the care economy? How can we better value women's work? How can we rebalance these questions of what's included in the, in the productive economy and what's not? And these are long-term economic questions. Um, how can we materialize negative externalities as values for polluters? Um, these are huge questions and that we, we try, this is part of what we try to do when we design kind of sustainability by design into our day-to-day -day business. It's not easy because you're bringing big economics questions down and to hit the world in the present day, but it means, you know, how, we, how, how is sustainability going to be valued by your company financially and non-financially? Let's take it out of these non-financial metrics where it should never ever have been. Um, and how can we think about building up uh, a business model that genuinely attributes value to sustainability over time and sustainable innovation? And then one last thing I would flag, flag uh, safeguard, uh, flag, sorry, these are big switches if we make them, but as a safeguard in the meantime, I think before you can continue to, to you know, question value and question capitalism, which, which need, will take place over a period of time, um, but is the concept of the precautionary principle. So the idea that being least risk averse um, as, a, as a company, as an organization in your in your day-to-day -day actions, taking a precautious approach when you don't know the outcome, and that's of climate change, we don't know what the outcome will be. We can try and put quantitative metrics against all of these things, but we cannot actually quantify it to the present day or even in the future. So taking that precautionary approach, if, if we don't have other alternatives to, to different types of value and different types of capitalism in the present day is where I think companies and organizations should be spending time. So I've just dropped into the chat an art article I just had published uh, last week, which uh, is very much aligned with uh, what several of you have just said. And it's, uh, it's got a kind of a grandiose title, the End Externalities Manifesto. But the theory is that um, the business world's uh, kind of baseline mission is shifting. And uh, the old Milton Friedman doctrine that corporations should do whatever it takes to maximize profits, return uh, the greatest uh, amount of money to their shareholders, uh, so long as it's not illegal, is uh, I think giving way to a new recognition of uh, stakeholder responsibility. And frankly, the idea that it's not acceptable for a business to profit, to privatize gains at social expense. 
whether that's emissions uh, out of a smokestack, uh, effluent out of pipeline into a nearby river, uh, or greenhouse gas emissions going into the atmosphere. All of that is a company, uh, in effect, uh, succeeding at the expense of society. And I think uh, the business world, frankly, has begun to accept this as a, as a change in the foundation, a change in the very mission of what corporations, uh, which are only constructs of society in every uh, country, corporations are simply legal entities created uh, under law by the society and, and therefore have some social obligations. So I think that's a, a, an interesting point that we maybe as a panel uh, and as a conversation here today agree upon. I want to take us now, if I can, to Kagiso's question um, in the Q&A. And uh, the issue is this, uh, really, we even if there is a commitment now to decarbonize, uh, even if countries are saying they want to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, what about the developing world? So highly dependent today on fossil fuels for power generation. How is it that we're gonna get, uh, and this is a flow of capital question, get the money to the developing world uh, so that they can make those investments in new infrastructure, new electricity uh, generation uh, in particular, and do so in a way that does not damage their competitiveness uh, and does not, frankly, limit their capacity to meet basic social needs at the same time. I think that's, in some regards, the fundamental question uh, for this uh, COP over the next 10 days, uh, and if we leave Glasgow with a, an answer to that question, a, a lot will unfold in a positive way. If this remains out there uh, in the ether, not yet pinned down, there will be many people saying uh, we did not get to the heart of the matter. Um, do any of you have a thought uh, in response to Kagiso's question and my uh, paraphrasing and uh, expounding upon it? Then I can certainly speak to just briefly on this, um, uh, just to remind everybody, we may have seen the South Africa announcement uh, today. Uh, I think that uh, relates to Kagiso's question very much. And I think it is a good model, good example, that if it becomes successful, can be also applicable to other countries where a large fossil fuel dependent company, ESCOM, under huge debt, $25 billion debt that they already have accumulated. And, and a number of wealthy countries have come together to form this partnership and they will be providing financial flows for this company to uh, phase out fossil fuel, this company to be broken into uh, various uh, units and, and turn to renewable energy as their main business. And I, I think the, of course, you know, I, I think if this kind of financing is, is viable and can be provided, I, I think this is necessary for many other countries as well. Otherwise, they are not going to make the transition on their own. I, I cannot imagine how, especially now after the, what is happening in South Africa, other countries would have similar expectation. And if we don't provide them that incentive, it will be only delaying those solutions. Uh, one other final point, I, I think there is a, a innovation here where the emission reductions achieved by South Africa will be provided as interest on the loan that they will receive. So they won't give, be giving the cash back as an interest, but emission reductions. I, I think we need to study this a little bit more, but there may be some making of an innovative model that can work in other countries also. Thank you. Others want to jump in? Um, yes, certainly. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, Pankaj. I think that's a very, uh, very uh, important point that Pankaj is making about, about the lessons we can learn from, from South African experiment. And I think it is, it is a step in the right direction. One thing to, uh, in my opinion, to, to consider here is, uh, um, and, and integrate more closely with, with, with finances is that, uh, uh, and in some ways it goes back to the previous question about capitalism, depending on how one defines it and what what, what aspects of capitalism we, we, uh, we consider here for reforms. Markets are not perfect, we know that, and we also know that, uh, that uh, markets can continue to behave in these imperfect ways for, for, for infinite amount of time, essentially, or long times. So I think it is important to, uh, to broaden the basket in the sense that uh, when we talk about finances, we should also talk about uh, uh, appropriate regulations at the same time. And that is the point that I'm making in this article is that we cannot leave financial markets to 
to uh, to 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 be the guiding force here. I think finance needs way more guidance than it is being given right now, and and that disciplining is certainly necessary. So it's not to me essentially a matter of flow of finance, but it is also a matter of how we manage that finance and 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 internal policies that different. Uh, different countries uh, may have to adopt. And I also think that we cannot give a generalizable answer to, to this at a global level, because the situation in, for example, India is dramatically different than the situation is in Ghana or, or any other country that would need development or, uh, uh, or, or uh, climate finance. And one last point then uh, is that I also think that climate finance needs to dovetail even more closely uh, with, uh, with, uh, with development finance. And, uh, and we are not seeing this, this confluence as closely as, as I think it would be important to see because uh, it is possible and, and we have seen some of it in, in, in my home country, India, is that climate finance creates its own core tree and then it only leads to exclusion of, uh, of a, a large number of companies as well as a large number of communities. So that, that, that uh, aspect of uh, equity and, and fairness and... and uh, uh, cleanliness in financial system is critically important. So I want to take us now, if I can, to Olga's question in the Q&A. And uh, to paraphrase again a little bit, uh, she's highlighting both uh, the fact that a, a Dutch pension fund announced they're going to sell their fossil fuel investments. And, and that brings us to the whole idea of divestment, uh, which a, a number of investors are, are uh, thinking about frankly, a number of uh, pension funds and, and for that matter, university endowments are being pushed to, uh, to take out of their portfolios the companies that are really not moving the world toward a sustainable future. But Ogle's also pointing out that there were some other pension funds, Nordic country pension funds, that announced they would invest uh, today. They announced they would be putting more of their money into green investments, again, trying to promote the sustainable future. So I, I want to invite, uh, particularly, I think, Martha and Nicole, to tell us what's your perspective on this uh, divest, uh, invest, uh, and some people say there's a third alternative, uh, which would be to engage with companies um, and try to steer them towards a more sustainable future. But Nicole, why don't I start with you and then I'll come to Martha. Sure. So I think that for the question of divest, invest, and invest and engagement, um, there's certainly something to be said that if you are simply a passive investor, and you are not able to engage, then having a fossil fuel free or a sort of ESG friendly index fund or investments is probably a, a better way of going forward in terms of just climate action. That said though, I think that there's really this question now of previously the idea of divesting um, was really, you know, sort of cutting edge, I'm cutting out fossil fuel investments, I'm cutting out high emitting sectors. And now we're moving towards this further option of how do I actually take that money and put it towards climate solutions. And I think that that's where you get this idea of, you know, investing in companies in renewable energy or climate solutions, even more sustainable development um, focused companies, or even just companies with really good ESG reporting and ESG focus. That said, though, I just want to clarify that there are all these ESG funds out there right now. And there's such a big proliferation of ESG investment that Oftentimes, ESG investing or ESG funds are just the best disclosure across the board. So you do find, you know, ESG funds that are really just the S&P 500 in a lot of ways, because those disclosures are the best within those industries. So I think that there's always this, this tension between what is actual green investments, what is sort of looks like a green investment, but could actually be, you know, pretty much a standard run of the mill investment. And then where is it that you're consciously investing in a high emitting company or a company that you feel could take better action on climate and actively sort of trying to hold their feet to the fire as much as you as a shareholder can. So I think that there's a lot of space between those. I think the idea of moving funds towards active climate solutions is a huge part of what we're gonna see in the future and is really sort of the future focus of climate investing, ways that you're not just avoiding emissions, but actually reducing emissions through your investment to the extent possible. And I don't necessarily know how to encourage that, but I think that it's absolutely worthwhile of being encouraged. All right, Martha, we'll let you uh, tell us how to encourage this uh, or further any other comments you want on, on this question. 
Sure. So I think Nicole's done a really good, uh, she's really laid out this kind of exit voice and loyalty trifecta that is at, that is at the heart of uh, impact investors today. Um, and I think that's something, I, so I really love this question because it's all about pension funds and pension funds and insurance companies, I think, are the institutional investors that are just so inherently um, embedded in, in the, it should be inherently embedded in the future well-being of their asset holders. Um, and I am going to, oh, I'm going to, I've got a favorite quote about pension funds and I'm going to tell it to you and then um, I'm going to explain it. So there's a great book. It's called Banking on Death or Investing in Life. And it's all about pension fund investment. And uh, it's quite near the opening. Um, Robin Blackburn, who is the author, says pensions may be thought tedious because they sacrifice the present to a remote future and spontaneity to calculation or because they embody a vain human attempt to control the future. And I just love this because it's all about. I have my pension. I need to be focusing on the future. This is all about me when I hit, you know, 65 for the last years of my life. Well, I mean, the last half of my life, hopefully. Um, but the same could be said about climate change, climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation. It's an exercise in controlling nature with a focus on number, on degrees, on risk management, on calculation. And I think we need to remember that in the past, you know, pension funds and insurance companies have been at the heart of developing the productive economy. They have channeled liquidity through to capital markets for years and years and years. And I think for me, the answer to your question, Dan, about you know, what is it that they can do now is really go back to the heart of why they invest, go back and re-understand fiduciary duty, go back and understand why it is, that what, what are they taking on on behalf of, of their, of their long-term um, uh, uh, you know, investors, which is all of us, especially in, a, in a, a country where it's almost mandatory to have a kind of pension fund. So I think I will add a pension fund element to Nicole's answer, but this question of fiduciary duty, I think, is really, really interesting. And it's been re reimagined and, and redefined recently over the last kind of 10 years. But I think we're at a climate crux now where we really need to start asking questions again about what does it mean to be long term investing on behalf of a huge population? I want to put one more topic on the table, which, again, we've touched on. And really, um, I'm uh, Raja. You, uh, no, I guess Pankaj, you wanted to uh, offer a further yes, thought on this. Please jump yes, right in. Yes, thank you. Sorry, yeah, just quickly on your the point on how do you encourage? I think we need to publish some stories on on the loss that uh, banks are going to experience, and some are already experiencing. Uh, right now, I think this story just also came today. A uh, World Bank had invested starting 2005 or until now about $20 billion in South Africa in setting up new coal fire power plants. And now they're investing in phasing them out under this new partnership. So what happened to that money and who lost that money? It was, it was a loss for public sector, but this is the kind of loss that is coming to the private sector also very soon. And so I, I think we need to publicize such stories and it will be very important now people to see these red flags that are starting to appear in, in some such places like what has happened in South Africa already. That, that's very helpful. And by the way, you've helped answer uh, another part of Aaron's earlier question about the need for uh, a risk management uh, kind of a, a professional structure that begins to put a price on some of these losses and gets people focused on the fact um, that there are climate related uh, failures going on that we should be looking at. So that's uh, very, very helpful. So let me turn to um, what may well be our final question here. And that is uh, one of the things that I find most impressive about the work that Pankaj and his colleagues have done to create the greenhouse gas emissions protocol is that it has really taken the field. It has become the dominant framework. And if you're not reporting on this framework, you're not reporting in many circumstances. You're not seen as serious. I want to um, raise the, a parallel question with regard to environmental, social, and governance metrics. I'm very worried and have been writing and researching on the prospect that we've got such divergent views about what it means to do an ESG disclosure. Uh, with people having, in many cases, their own view of what to report, how to report. There is no methodological consistency. Even when we say we're reporting scope three, people don't report the same way, all of which makes true apples to apples comparisons difficult. Frankly, it makes it difficult to identify the leaders or to call out the laggards. Uh, and I think it leads some of the finance world just to throw up their hands and say, this isn't a mature arena. We can't, we don't really have investment grade data. 
So we cannot drive uh, portfolio decisions based on this. Now, my view is the rising flood of mainstream investors who want sustainability factored in, who want better alignment between their values and their portfolios are going to insist that the finance world do better. But who should step up? What's the way to get to where we are with greenhouse gas emissions reporting, which is there is an established methodology. So I think, you know, again, Nicole may be uh, first and then Martha second. Um, do we need um, a government structure here? Uh, who, who needs to get us on a common track? We absolutely need a government structure. Um, I think in both globally and in the US, there needs to be a climate risk disclosure mandate and a framework that includes things like um, the calculations that you need to make for scope three, as you mentioned. Also, one of the things that I know is gaining a little bit of traction and we fully support is the idea that your sustainability or climate disclosures need to be audited and verified by a third party to ensure accuracy and consistency. That the numbers that you're coming up with, you know, that's transparent in terms of its calculation and its measurement. So I would say absolutely we need some sort of regulatory framework that is globally mandated, at least for publicly traded companies and ideally even for larger you know, private companies with a phase in approach. Um, and we need it yesterday, but certainly in the coming years, 100%. Thank you, Martha, a thought to add on that. Yeah, I tend to agree, but I think there's some real caveats here. Um, there are geographical differences that need to be treated sensitively and need to be included. We can't all be reporting to what is thought of on either coast of the US. There needs to be geographical flux. Governance issues in particular, here in the UK, one reports culture issues under governance. Culture is uh, un under the um, Financial Reporting Council. This world, culture is not gonna be seen the same across the world. Diversity and inclusion are not gonna be similar. Um, uh, you know, The outputs, the outcomes are not gonna be similar across the world. So I agree, and you do have, you know, IIRC, SAS, BGRI are coming together over time to pick three different ESG frameworks. Um, but I, I just would flag some caveats. And one thing I also would say is I'm coming from a really interesting place in, here in the UK in that we've got the task force on climate related financial disclosures has come into mandatory reporting for premium listed companies on the London Stock Exchange from this coming year. So we'll see the first reports come out in the spring. We've done some early um, analysis of, of pre-mandatory reporting. I'll put a, um, a link in the chat to our paper, but finding out how difficult companies are finding it with the lack of guidance that's currently there or the amount of guidance that's currently there, but is, is not in that mandatory phase has been really interesting. Um, but the TCFD at least is in place. And when the TNFD, the task force on nature related financial disclosures, which is obviously at play now, the task force has been set up, when that comes out, it should be able to align with this, where well, we will see that it might align with this kind of four part, like four pillar, 11 recommendations process that TCFD has. So I think there's something about bringing together the frameworks, but also just um, harmonizing the structure so that companies know there are four things to report on and 11 under those or that kind of thing, making that into a kind of harmony. And I would say it's not just the array of metrics, it is the methodologies underneath. Yeah. We need to have both because otherwise there is a, a, a breakdown. Um, a further thought on that, or frankly, with our, our last minute uh, clicking away here, a, a closing 20 seconds from any of you on, on any of the topics we've addressed today, a, a final word you'd like to leave the audience with. I, I would thank you, Dan. And just quickly, I would say that we have to collectively make a much stronger progress in at least in the greenhouse gas protocol world. We are seriously looking into a perhaps a scope X to be named. Please don't quote me, but what should be that category for system impacts? And unless we account for them, we likely are going to see leakage and we will overall see global ambition, uh, global emissions still keep rising. So, and also thank you for this opportunity, beautiful panel, beautiful discussion and great facilitation. Thank you very much. Other closing thoughts. By the way, Pankaj, you've just answered another question of someone who wanted us to see whether we shouldn't have scope zero, which was uh, really to focus on finance impacts. I, I think that's a creative idea. So uh, thank you in your closing thought for getting one more question clicked off. Uh, a, a last comment from any of the others of you. I want to uh, essentially double down on what Martha was saying that yes, there is need for standardization, but we need to be extremely sensitive about, uh, about the geographical differences. And not only that, um, a large number of SMEs that I have, I, I have talked to in, in, in last decade or so, 
they are extremely worried about these standardization because as they become entrenched in, 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 in corporate practices and, and, and supply chain uh, requirements and all that, they find it extremely difficult even to comply with them, never mind improving upon because of the costs involved in, in, uh, in, in those processes. So um, I think, yes, there is important, I mean, there is, there is, there is value in the standardization, but uh, as you said, then I think the concern should be more about methodology rather than the reporting and all those things that can be left at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at the entity level uh, uh, discretion. Yeah, thank you very much again. It was wonderful. Well, I am going to bring us to a close with uh, a thanks to a fabulous panel. I hope the audience that's still uh, participating can join me in a virtual round of applause for outstanding contributions from a number of different directions. I also want to thank uh, Dorothea Struber of the uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network and the entire SDSN team that pulled together not only our program today, uh, a, a fabulous panel, but frankly, the entire zero emissions solutions conference that is coming uh, to you all across this whole week. Uh, it is a important contribution to the conversation for COP26. I think it's picking up critical issues and it really does represent exactly the kind of uh, thoughtful conversation that in some regards uh, on the uh, outside of the official conversation helps to shape the dialogue in terms of what goes into agreements and really does influence in a very profound way, uh, I think, the scope and direction of the agreements that people come to uh, at the government level. Again, I would encourage all of you who have listened in to go look at the SDSN action set of essays, the, the climate-focused uh, special edition that's just come out. There's a lot there to work with. And I think it is fabulous to see the kind of thinking that's going on as the world mobilizes uh, in so many directions to deliver a clean energy future, deep decarbonization, and a successful response to climate change, not just in one country, but across all the nations of the world. And with that, I close this out in terms of today's panel uh, and look forward to seeing a number of you tomorrow as the SDSN uh, conference continues. Good night. Good afternoon. Good morning to those of you on the West Coast of the United States. And uh, for those who are in far um, the far Eastern time zones, uh, welcome to a new day. Take care and hope to continue the conversation in the uh, days and weeks ahead. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.